Hello world! In today's video, we are going to understand the details related to the hardware design of the I2C bus. This one is part 3. You may want to check part 1 and 2 where I have covered other details related to the I2C bus and the link to these videos are in the description below. So we'll approach this topic related to the hardware design in a step-by-step -step manner. I2C uses an open drain or open collector design. To understand this, let's look at the push-pull interface which is used in SPI. It comprises of a PMOS and an NMOS FET or PJT. As the name suggests, the push-pull output operates either in the push phase or the pull phase. When the input is at logic low, the PMOS is on, the NMOS is off and the current flows through the PMOS. Thus, the output has a low impedance connection to VDD. This is nothing but the push phase. If the input is at logic high, the NMOS is on, the PMOS transistor is off. The output thus has a low impedance connection to ground. This is pull phase. That's how you get push-pull output stage. Remember that the low impedance nature of the connections controls the output. This configuration is commonly used in interfaces that have unidirectional communication or wherein the data is flowing only in one direction, like in case of SPI, UART, etc. In case of SPI, MOSI is nothing but master out, slave in pin. Here, the master generates 0 and 1 using the push-pull circuit and the slave simply samples the current state of the MOSI bus. Now that gives you unidirectional communication. It will not be useful for bidirectional communication and let's understand the reason behind the same. If two push-pull outputs are connected directly and if one is driving the output high and the other is driving it low, then clearly the current will flow freely from VDD to ground, resulting in short circuit, which will damage the devices involved in communication. This issue is mitigated by using something called as open drain configuration. Let's understand what open drain is. Here we only have an NMOS. The PMOS is removed. Thus, you can get either logic 0 at the output or it will float or is in open state. Thus, it either drains the current or remains in high impedance open state. That's how we get the name open drain. Now, to get logic 1, we need to add an additional component to this circuit which is nothing but an external pull-up resistor. Now when the NMOS isn't conducting, at that time the output is driven to VDD via the pull-up resistor. Thus we get logic 0 when NMOS is conducting and logic 1 when it isn't. That is by default. Now for bidirectional communication, we'll connect two open drain outputs together. If one is driving the output low and the other is driving it high, then the pull-up resistor ensures that the current doesn't flow freely from VDD to ground. Thus, there is no short circuit in this case. Therefore, I2C uses an open drain with a pull-up and an input buffer on the same line which allows a single data line for bidirectional data flow. Now there are some important implications of open drain configuration and we look at each one of these one by one. So the first implication is that the bus line is at logic high or one by default due to the pull up resistor. The devices can determine if the bus is available for new transmissions by observing if both the SDA and SCL are at logic high for a certain amount of time. The devices can only pull the bus low. If an I2C master communicates with a slave that has become, say, non-functional, the data signal never enters an undefined state. As the slave is not driving the signal, the data line will always be at logic 1. Also, if a master device becomes non-functional during the middle of a transmission, then both the SDA and SCL return to logic high. Thus, the line is at logic 1 when none of the devices are trying to pull it low. This results 
in something called as wired and configuration where if any one input is zero then the output is zero and if all the inputs are one then the output is one the second implication is that any device on the bus can safely drive the signals to logic low even if another device is trying to drive it high because of this i squared c supports multi master communication as we've seen in part 2 or in the previous video a master that transmits a high but sees the line low as another one is trying to pull it low loses the arbitration and goes back to slave mode additionally due to the very same implication clock stretching is also possible where even though the master generates the scl the slave device can hold the scl line low thereby pausing the transaction also due to open drain devices with different supply voltages can coexist on the same bus provided that the lower voltage devices have damage protection from high voltages for example a 5 volt device and a 3.3 volt device can be connected on the same line with both sda and scl pulled to 5 volts the open drain configuration causes the logic high to reach 5 volts in case of the push pull output stage a 3.3 volt device cannot drive to 5 volts all right let's summarize everything about the open drain configuration of i squared c by considering a simple analogy so the communication lines that is sda and scl are like a harness or a rope which is used in a bus and the devices are like passengers traveling in the bus they can signal the driver to stop the bus by yanking or by pulling down the rope and the tension in the rope acts like the pull up resistor which pulls it back up after it is released by the device now we've already looked at the advantages associated with the open drain configuration let's understand the constraints and how we can take these into account while designing the circuit now there is a capacitance which is associated with both the data and clock lines it is labeled as stray capacitance but it is the unavoidable capacitance that exists in the semiconductor structures connected to the lines this capacitance is higher if there are many devices connected and lower otherwise nevertheless the point is that the voltage changes on the lines are constrained by the time required to charge or discharge the capacitance associated with a particular node when the output transitions from low to high state at that time the capacitance gets charged and the value of the pull up resistor decides the charging time the discharge time on the other hand depends on the low impedance of in mos transistor thus obviously the rise time will be significantly slower due to the high value of pull up resistor than the fall time which is dependent on the low impedance of in mos transistor so this results in the classic i squared c sawtooth waveform now the most obvious question that will arise is how can we determine the value of the pull up resistor now a high value of pull up resistor leads to an increase in the rise time which eventually imposes a limitation on the maximum attainable clock frequency ideally both r and c are factors that determine the rc time constant but we have little control over capacitance as it is determined primarily by the number of the devices on the bus and the nature of interconnection between these devices lower values of pull up resistor result in a higher speed but it will cause a large current to flow through the in mos transistor which will lead to heat dissipation and this can ultimately damage the device So according to the I squared C specification the sink current in the standard mode can have a maximum value of 3 milliamperes thus we must consider this value while selecting the RP or the pull up resistor for the circuit now how do we understand if the sink current in our circuit is above the 3 milliamperes limitation 
So when the sink current increases, the voltage drop across the transistor also increases. The voltage drop across the transistor is known as the low level output voltage. It is the voltage level when the signal is at logic low. The I2C bus specification also sets a maximum of 0.4 volts for the low level output voltage because it indicates that a maximum sink current of 3 milliamperes is flowing across the transistor. And you can see the trace of the voltage on your oscilloscope. So let's calculate the minimum value of RP or the pull-up resistor by considering these worst case values of 3 milliamperes and 0.4 volts. So if VCC is 3.3 volts, then RP will be 967 ohms and if VCC is 5 volts, in that case it will be 1.53 kilo ohms. Therefore, RP minimum is known. What about pull-up resistor maximum value or RP max? So we can find that by considering this formula which is T rise is equal to RP max into C. Now I squared C standard mode specifications state that the maximum rise time can be 1000 nanoseconds in standard mode. This is nothing but the time required for the voltage to reach 70% of VDD from 30% of VDD. According to the I squared C specification, voltage is not considered logic high until it reaches 70% of VDD. The RC time constant tells us how long it'll take for a voltage to reach approximately 63% of the final voltage. So for simplicity, we'll assume that RC tells us how long it'll take for the signal to rise from a voltage near ground potential to the logic high voltage. Thus, we've considered this formula. The value of capacitance can be measured by assembling the entire system. And if this is impossible, then a rough estimate can be made by finding the pin capacitance for each device. This can be uh, found in the data sheet. Then 3 picofarad per inch of PCB trace and 30 picofarad per foot of coaxial cable should be added to this number. Now, I didn't find these numbers magically. They're provided in a PDF and the link to that is in the description below. So let us assume that the total capacitance is 100 picofarad, just as an example value. Then 1000 nanoseconds equals to RP max into 100 picofarad, which gives RP max value of 10 kilo ohms. So this particular maximum value gives you minimum power consumption and the minimum value gives us maximum attainable speed value. We can also calculate or make approximation of speed. If you want the clock high time to be say at least thrice the rise time, then you will have T high equals to 3000 nanoseconds. Thus, your maximum attainable frequency will be 167 kilohertz. If you want a higher value, then you can lower the resistance by obviously keeping the minimum value of your pull-up resistor into consideration. Ideally, standard mode limits the clock speed to 100 kilohertz, so you should be good with 167 kilohertz, but it can be adjusted according to your system's requirements. Thus, the trade-off for the selection of your pull-up resistor is speed versus power dissipation. You can swap in different resistors and settle for a reasonable value. I squared C specification also puts a limit on the maximum capacitance and the value for that is 400 picofarad in standard mode. Practically, one can put up to 10 devices on I squared C bus without much problem and generally the pull up resistor value can be set between 2.2 kilo ohms to 4.7 kilo ohms. If you put 30 devices, then capacitance may go beyond the maximum limit. Also, a lot of devices means a long bus, more than 20 to 25 centimeters. And a long bus has problems with noise pickup as well. And noisy I squared C buses causes a spike on the data line when the clock is high. And this can cause the devices to see an improper start or stop condition. This confuses the device and may cause the bus to hang. In systems that need lots of devices, on the bus, one can use a multiplexer to effectively create multiple buses, each with a limited number of devices. In systems that require a long bus, which is say beyond 30 centimeters, the best thing is either don't use I squared C bus or use repeaters to isolate the bus into segments, keeping the capacitance under control as well as the noise. So 
that is it for today. The aim of this video was to make you familiar with the details involved in the I2C hardware design. So if it has served its purpose, then do drop a like, share the video and please subscribe to the channel. Also, do let me know if you would want me to cover some specific topics related to embedded systems. You can drop in the suggestions in the comment section below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye world!